So we're delighted that our brother Dave is going to exhort us this morning and to introduce his remarks. We're going to take a reading and that reading is from Exodus 3. I'd ask our brother Phil Window to come forward and read Exodus chapter 3 for us. Good morning, my dear young people, fantastic young people, all of those people that are joining us here today uh, and for those on Zoom and particularly uh, the darling Laura on her back but recovering well from yesterday's little episode. Uh, good morning to her as well. Good morning to Jack in Queensland and anyone else. Um, it is a fantastic morning and we come here to consider the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, his sacrifice. We come to consider uh, what God has done on our behalf. And by means of encouragement, it's my privilege and opportunity to uh, consider with you the word of God, particularly around Exodus chapter 3 and particularly around the theme today of commitment to our calling. And I chose that theme based on the fact in the very early piece of my thoughts around um, the consideration of Exodus chapter 3, our reading for today, on our commitment to God in our calling. And yet by the end of um, my thoughts uh, in preparation for this morning, my consideration has almost changed, not so much in that we still need to be committed to our calling, but I couldn't help but be shown from God how committed God is to our calling. Yes, it is a wonderful thing to be committed to our calling. There is no question of that, and we'll consider that to our, for ourselves this morning, but how fantastic it is to consider God from the perspective of how committed he is to our calling. So our thoughts this morning will bring out the parallels in, in some respects of the commitment from ourself and the commitment, importantly, that God has to us. And I think that's very encouraging as we consider ourselves, we consider the example of Moses, we consider the example of Jesus Christ before us. Now, I'm very mindful of the fact that some of you in the audience taught me this Sunday school lesson um, many, many years ago. Uh, from Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush and the other um, surrounding stories. So I don't hope in any way to tell you anything new necessarily this morning, but I do hope to encourage us that we might be fitting for uh, preparing our minds for the emblems that are here before us. And by means of doing that, all I want to do is consider just a few examples from uh, this chapter. We won't divert too far out of it. And there are six examples in total. I won't necessarily read them out as we go through. You'll probably pick them up as we go. But I wanted to share with you uh, the considerations that I've gleaned from this particular chapter. And it sort of follows on, not that I knew it at the time, but it sort of follows on from our reading from yesterday uh, at the Boat Activity Day, which the good Dr. Jones led us through with and some very intriguing questions to go alongside. I don't have lollies. I don't have questions. But if you have an answer, you're very welcome to throw it forward. So, verse 1, chapter 3 of Exodus. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside or the west side of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. What stands out there for me? What stands out there for you, I guess? Well, it's been nearly 40 years since we heard of Moses from chapter 2. He fled out of Egypt, and he fled to um, the land of Midian, and from there he met a wife, he met a lady and became his wife, and his father-in-law then since became his employer. And for 40 years, or thereabouts, Moses was a shepherd. Now, the significance of that really struck me. I thought to myself, you know, Moses put up with a lot with the children of Israel in the wilderness, and it was for 40 years, but he'd already done that himself, hadn't he? In this particular instance, here's the example of Moses already doing it himself. Except they weren't people in this particular um, example. They were real sheep. And he's looking after them on behalf of his father. And so the example leads forward, doesn't it? Moses then proceeds to lead the children out of Egypt into the wilderness to the promised land waiting for redemption for 40 years as a shepherd leading the sheep for his father. 
And I think to myself, looking at our theme for this morning, commitment to our calling. Here's commitment by God to prepare the way. God never asks of us anything that is too great of us. And Jesus never asks of us anything that he hadn't done before. And here's Moses requested by God to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt for deliverance into the promised land. And in a way, we ourselves are treading the wilderness. We are going through the challenges of life, just like the children of Israel did in preparation for the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And the instance of verse 1 of chapter 3 of Exodus is emphasised on the fact that Moses led the sheep. If you're a farmer here in Australia particularly, and you have sheep, cattle, generally speaking, you're a drover. And the reason you're a drover is because the multitude of the sheep in their thousands is too hard to lead, you're driving them. And generally speaking, you have a cattle dog or descriptions of that, helicopters, motorbikes, et cetera, et cetera. But, and Phil can tell us all about it, I'm sure. You're droving or you're driving the sheep. But Moses is leading the sheep. And here's the example for us. Jesus leads us. He's not driving us. He's not a drover. He's a shepherd. And the examples in Scripture from Exodus or Genesis, if you like, through to Revelation are amazing in what we can glean from just a few small words of Scripture and the examples of our daily readings, which is Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4 this morning. Moses was being trained to be a leader, not a driver. And so in our wilderness wanderings today of 40 years or more, probably 70, God willing, are we driving or are we leading? Are we allowing God to lead our life and are we leading those around us or can we be a little hard at times? Can we even ignore the sheep around us? And this was the exhort from our good brother Mark last Sunday of the 99. And can we lead by example? Here's some thoughts from Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 of those things. And so we also says um, <clears throat> in this particular verse, and this is our second example, that the mountain of God was called Horeb. God appears to place great significance on destinations or places in Scripture from Genesis, again, through to Revelation. There are many instances of locations in the Bible that have great significance to God. Jerusalem would have to be one of the most classic examples of that, wouldn't it? Everyone knows Jerusalem. Everyone knows that God loves Jerusalem, and everyone knows that it will be the future capital of the world. Shechem could be another one that comes to mind. Bethlehem, all these places we know well, they have great significance to God. And this mount, this particular mount that we're first introduced to by name in chapter 3 of Exodus and verse 1, will place great significance in Moses' life for the rest of his life. And it certainly does for us as well. Mount Horeb or Sinai, or the wilderness of Sinai as it's known commonly interchanged, was of significance to God and significance to Moses. It was where, in many ways, God introduced himself to Moses and Moses met God. It was also the place, a little later down the track, where God's glory was shown to him, to Moses. It was also the place where the Ten Commandments were given to Moses. It was also the place where in that vicinity, Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it. There was great significance, and so it is that locations in the Bible to God have great significance. But what is the significance to us? I ask myself, you may be asking yourself. Well, we don't meet at Horeb. We aren't in location proximity to Sinai. And we don't have the privilege of being in the Middle East right now. But what we do is by location, if you like, meet here, not necessarily in this same hall every day, but we meet by location at the Lord's table. 
Sunday by Sunday by Sunday. Why? Because the shepherd, the good shepherd, commanded us to do so. Not only commanded, he invites us to do so every week. In fact, the early ecclesias and Paul's works, uh, I think it's Paul's words, says, do this as often as you meet in remembrance of me. The early ecclesial life, of course, was significantly different to our um, English sense of the word or sense of worship today. Uh, It's very convenient for us on a Sunday to come every Sunday and meet. And yet in those early times, it was as often as they met, do this in remembrance of me, to remember the bread and the wine. But aside of all that, the significance is by location, we come here. We sit at the feet, if it were, of our shepherd. He leads us all by name and he brings us to a place of comfort, a place of fellowship, a place of worship, a place of commandments that are given to us, 10 if you like, a place of God showing us his glory and a place where God declares his name. And we'll have a look at that in just a moment. And so there's a very significant moment that happens in Moses' life in this particular chapter. It astounds us and we understand the significance of it in many ways. And it's the burning bush. It's found in verse 2 of chapter 3 in front of us. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. I guess this, this memory, if those of you have grown up in Sunday school, has, is etched in our minds, if you like, of this burning bush and we might have drawn it at Sunday school. We've put cellophane around it and here's this bush that we hold up in front of everybody that has not consumed, burning with fire. It was a sign to Moses. It was a significant sign. He'd never seen it before. And I'm sure it was quite uh, amazing to him. God's sign to us and to Moses' life is significant. One, it never changed. Two, his word never changes. And three, his plan and purpose never changes. Or in the words of Exodus chapter 3 here, it never consumed. It never, ever changed. Think about our calling, just like Moses' calling. And I've never ceased to amaze me in these last days particularly, the the miraculous calling of each of those who are baptised. I think that is a miraculous thing. There is so much in the world around us that can be of enticement, that can be of greater enticement than the burning bush that never changes. The world around us continues to change and evolve. In fact, From one day to the next, it can change. Yet the word of God never, ever consumes and never changes. It remains the same. Think about your calling. Think about my calling. How amazing it is, particularly for those of you who have been hit like a rock from coming from outside. What was it that changed your life? Did it strike you as being a burning bush that never consumed? that it was so significant as a milestone in your life that you could not ignore it any longer. That's what the word of God does for us. That's what the truth is. There are 66 burning bushes that we now have in front of us on our laps. 66 of them. They're significant in the fact that they've never changed. They're not consumed. They never change. God's word from Genesis through to Revelation has never changed. He introduces himself to us by these books from Genesis to Revelation and they have never, ever changed. His word, his message, his intent, his name, his plan and purpose, they have never changed. How amazing is that? The burning bush that never consumed. It changed Moses' life significantly for the rest of his life forever for good. God willing, it will do the same for us as well. Our fourth example is found in verse 6. I'll read that for you. Moreover, uh, he said, I am the God of the father of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. 
And the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Well, this is a direct reflection on the promise, the covenant that God had made previously in Genesis to the fathers of old that Moses knew very well of. He was a Hebrew. He was born into a Hebrew family, and yet he forsook in many ways that family for some time due to the circumstances that prevailed in his life. And here is God through a burning bush that was never consumed by anything else, calling to mind for Abraham's sake the covenant confirmed by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and for the future by Jesus Messiah. So he begins his message to Moses with a confirmation of the covenant he had already made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That promise was that they would inherit a land that was to be flowing with milk and honey. In other words, a life that would be full of blessings, full of prosperity, full of stresslessness in trust in God. And in a reminder of his covenant, it reminds me of this particular example which has been pre-prepared here on this rostrum for me. And I'll just pick it up very carefully. Sorry, Jane, won't take long. Thank you. The example, this is the example. Uncle Fran has put his glasses on. Pick it up there. See that? That's the example. The example through the covenant, of course, is that Abraham's seed would be as that grain there. It's just there. That grain of sand. The significance is that Abraham's seed would become as the grains that are in the sand on the seashore for multitude. And I can pick that up any day of the week, anywhere, anytime, as you can as well. How amazing is this example that Moses is being taught, that he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of promise, the God that wishes to fill this earth with his glory and the multitude that will fill the earth will be as much as the sand upon the seashore for multitude. There's room for all, in other words. It's not like there's only room for 99 or 100. There's room for all. And that's the example and the covenant confirmed that God raises to Moses' mind. And it took my mind to Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, where if we believe and have the same faith as Abraham, we are counted as Abraham's seed. And later in that chapter, in chapter 3 of Galatians 27 to, through to 29, it exhorts us that if we have Abraham's seed and if we have Christ's seed through faith and belief in that, then we are heirs according to the promise. So here's this promise being explained in very good detail to Moses, that he is the father of, God, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God brings us to Horeb every Sunday, the place where he gave us the commandments, the place where he was able to explain his name and does so every Sunday. And he says, guess what? Not only is there room for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all their seed, but you're their seed as well, and there's room for you. I'm committed to your calling because each one of us in this room have been called. God's commitment to us is only let down by our lack of commitment in return to our calling. So the example for us is, as it is to Moses in our reminder of coming here Sunday by Sunday to the Mount Horeb, as it were, is to remember that he invited us to be here first of all. It wasn't that we decided to come here or come to the table of the Lord and to receive fellowship and to be baptised and to understand the covenant of confirmation in Jesus Christ through the forgiveness of sins. It was God that committed to us in our life first. How amazing is that? What wonderful little examples that we can glean from this chapter in chapter 3 of Exodus for our daily readings for today. And, you know, if we wanted to see a burning bush today, we only have to pick up the 66 burning bushes, don't we? But if we were to be reminded of God's covenant as a promise to us in our day today, what would be that burning bush? 
To me, Ezekiel chapter 37, chapter 38, and then 40 to 48 are the most amazing examples of the burning bush in our era, if you like, today, from 1948 through to now. 1948 was the significance of the valley of dry bones being resurrected from Ezekiel chapter 37. There's an author by the name of Ian Baxter. He's a military historian. He's just released a book um, only two weeks ago, um, and it's on the death of the Jews uh, from Auschwitz through to other concentration camps. The estimation of the Valley of Dry Bones was six million of them. See the significance of how God continues to work in our life, providing burning bushes in any part of every era of any life. It's, it brings me to tears, and it certainly did when I was reading, again, the reminder of the significance of the pain and the anguish and the toil of that nation. From Abraham through to now, six million of them perished before the Valley of Dry Bones was resurrected in chapter 37. How significant of that of a burning bush in our life today? Chapter 38, of course, is very much Jamin's on par, excitable chapter. Tells us every year, every week, um, and for very good reason. The nations are being assembled for Armageddon. There is very little time left. And as we assemble ourselves here before Mount Horeb, in commandments that God gives us, it does us well to remember God's commitment to us and therefore our commitment to our calling. Verse 14, our fifth example, I am that I am. Have a look at this. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. This is in, of course, response to what Moses asked of God and said, well, God, okay, what do I do? How do I address the nation, so to speak? Who do I tell who you are? And this is God's example. I am that I am. Or better rendered, I will be who I will be. Rotherham, who is probably... Um, the go-to reference in terms of um, Hebrew restoration to English, I will become whatsoever I may become. This was God's pledge. This was God's purpose. This was God's name. And we're reminded of it, not only in his name in, in chapter 3 of Exodus uh, uh, verse 14, but Moses had the most awesome privilege of not only speaking directly to God, as it were, the angel that was there in this burning bush, but in chapter 34 of this same book, Exodus chapter 34, he gives the glory. So to Moses, he gives his name, and to Moses, he explains his name, what his purpose is all about. Exodus 34, well, chapter 33, actually, Moses says, show me thy glory. In chapter 34, God says, I'll show you my glory. This is it. And in Numbers chapter 14, verse 21, as truly as I live, all the earth will be full of that glory. What was that glory? It was the glory that was described in chapter 34 of Exodus, wasn't it? Mercifulness, graciousness, long-suffering, mm -hmm. abundant in goodness, and peace and mercy, forgiving those around And so here we are today. God is desiring to become us, not as us ourselves, but he wants to become us. He wants us to become just like him. And in doing that, he seeks and desires to be committed to our calling. He seeks and desires to be committed to the fellowship that we receive and share every Sunday as we come to the mount, as it were, I will be who I will be. Our sixth and final point for our words of exhortation and encouragement this morning, brothers and sisters, is, is taken from chapter, uh, where is it? Mm, commitment to the calling. Uh, it's chapter four. Chapter four and verse 31. And when the people believed 
And when they had heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their afflictions, then they bowed their heads and they worshipped. So I actually, I, I find great um, comfort in this particular example that I want to share with you today. Um, it's just an amazing thing. It's fairly insignificant as a verse to read, but the response of the people is what strikes me most of all. The people believed in the commitment. And the, the, the order in which it was believed by is, is not misplaced in Scripture as it's described here. It was believed by Moses. It was believed by Aaron. It was believed by the elders. And it was believed by the nation. So the delivery of the message significantly to Moses and then to Aaron, who was obviously by vision uh, in a separate concourse uh, or communication because uh, Aaron then met Moses and they were glad together of this message, then uh, relayed it to the elders and then they relayed it to the nation. It was when they saw and heard what message was um, that God was going to deliver the nation of Israel. The significance was that God has an attention to detail God. He says back in chapter 3 um, to Moses, chapter 3 and, and verse 7, he says, The Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. The attention to detail is this. He, he tells Moses he knows the location of his people. He tells Moses that they're in pain. He tells Moses that they're in pain because of their taskmasters and he says he understands their sorrows. Now, if that isn't a commitment by God in heaven to a people that are undeserving, just like you and I, yet is still prepared to continue to save and to forgive and to lead as a shepherd every day of our lives, I don't know what else would be. He knew their location he knew their taskmasters, he knew their pain, and he understood their sorrow. That just about sums up what we need in our life, isn't it? In our wilderness wanderings as we meet at Horeb each week, from the commandments that were given to us on that mount, to the understanding of who God is by name, to the significance of how he describes his purpose through his glory, mercy, forgiveness, long-suffering. That's all we need. We just need God to understand our location, who we are, where we are, what we're doing. We need him to understand that we're under taskmasters and that's the life we, we live of this world but not in it. And we need him to understand that the sorrow we feel now will be wiped away because he tells us that the kingdom will wipe away every tear. So it was significant for the children of Israel back then. It's significant particularly for our day today now as we come Sunday by Sunday to meet before our Lord, to understand his commitment, to understand our calling and to understand what we need to do about it. For the children of Israel, that journey really began at the Passover, didn't it? We know the significance of those events, the red lentil, uh, <laughs> the red lentil, the lentil that was painted on the doors, red, blood, was a significant um, milestone in people's lives, I so to speak. They endured what they had to endure, and they knew that where they met in fellowship under those houses, they were to be saved by Passover, the angel passing over. The Passover, in many ways, for Jesus' life, for his ascension to heaven, began at that Last Supper that last Passover he shared with his disciples. And the Passover that we now remember Sunday by Sunday as we meet here every Sunday, not necessarily here at this location, but in remembrance by fellowship, joining together as a community to understand what has been done for us and God's commitment to us really is the beginning of our life as well. It's the significance of the journey upon which we're on. And God has called each one of us to that. And so we come to remember our Lord this morning. We remember Jesus' sacrifice. 
his commitment, the emotional turmoil, the pain, the suffering, the anguish, and yet for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So this passage of Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4 of our daily readings today holds great significance in its just a few short verses that we've considered this morning. It encourages us, it reminds us, it, in, it exhorts us to be committed to our calling because God, never ever forget this, is committed to ours. Mm-hmm.